December 7th, 1941. An aerial strike force gathers and executes a surprise attack on the U.S. Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor. Its aim, to bring a nation to its knees. Thousands die in one of the most devastating defeats in military history. Now, by examining events leading up to the attack and analyzing previously classified military records, a Japanese intelligence expert discovers why the raid was such a total disaster for the Empire of Japan. Disasters don't just happen. They are triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. a.m. The Sea of Japan, 6,500 kilometers from Pearl Harbor. For Japan's strategic mastermind, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, today is the culmination of years of research and planning. The attack on Pearl Harbor will be the first blow in a wave of attacks across the Pacific as Japan seeks to carve out an empire. Now, the planning is over and the storm is about to break. Aircraft carrier Hiryu, Central Pacific. Putting the plan into action, is down to Japanese naval aviators like Takeo Shiro. First thing in the morning, I woke up and went up onto the flight deck. There was maybe 50% cloud cover, so I thought this will be okay. We'll be able to attack. As the observer on a Type 97 carrier attack bomber, he'll be in the first wave of the attack that plunges his nation into war. I thought it would be one hell of a day. If Japan provoked or started a war, it would probably last for a very long time, and we might die here today. I thought it would be terribly serious for the country. The Japanese air crews who will spearhead the attack are under no illusions about the scale of the task that faces them. We were prepared to die in battle. We were told to write a farewell note home to our parents with some of our hair and nails as mementos. So we cut our hair and nails and wrapped them up with the farewell message so that if we did die, they could be delivered home. 6.30 a.m. Battleship Row, Pearl Harbor. Deep in the armored belly of the battleship USS Arizona, Don Stratton starts the day like any other Sunday with the ship in port. On Sunday morning, it was just a clean sweep down. Sunday was just kind of a leisure day for everybody. Everyone on the warship is running to a peacetime routine. I did have some extra oranges on the chow table, and I was going to take them down to sick bay to a buddy of mine. Moored at the east side of the anchorage is the heavy cruiser USS San Francisco. Marine Private Mal Middlesworth is one of the skeleton crew manning the ship while it waits for repairs. Duties are light, and the crew makes plans for their shore leave. There's a lot of conversation of what you did on Last Liberty, what you're going to do on this Liberty, uh, what time you're coming back. You might talk about some uh, mail that you got in home. 370 kilometers out to sea, the storm is gathering. This captured Japanese film shows the final moments as the massive strike force of 180 bombers and fighters gets underway. The fighters were on the leading edge, then carrier dive bombers, then carrier attack bombers at different heights, with horizontal formations too. We flew around about the task force getting into position. And then, when we were all in formation, we set off. 
702, Opana Point, Hawaii. At a newly installed radar site in the far northwest of Oahu, novice operators George Elliott and Joseph Lockhart have something unexpected on their screens. The radar shows more aircraft than they've ever seen heading inland at high speed. Their report comes to Army Lieutenant Kermit A. Tyler. He's expecting a flight of B-17 bombers from the mainland. But the bombers of the 38th Recon Squadron are still hundreds of kilometers away. The planes on the radar scope are an aerial armada, the first wave of the strike force for the most powerful carrier fleet ever assembled. And the 84,000 servicemen on the island of Oahu have no idea what's about to hit them. The first wave of Japanese bombers flies south across Oahu, completely unopposed. For Takeo Shiro, it seems more like a training flight than war. In training, we used a large model of the whole island, with mountains, cane fields. So on the mission, it was as if I saw that model. When I flew over the mountains and cane fields en route, it felt like somewhere I'd been or seen before. Only when the first wave of Japanese planes arrives over Honolulu can they be sure that they've achieved total surprise. Seen from above, I felt it was just a quiet, pretty town. Realizing they've caught the Americans off guard, the Japanese break radio silence to signal the aircraft carrier Hiryu with the pre-arranged code words, Toro, 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 meaning tiger, 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 or attack, attack, attack. From this moment, every plane in the aerial armada is supposed to follow a carefully orchestrated attack plan. If we achieved a surprise attack, plan A was for the torpedo bombers to go in first, with the carrier dive bombers afterwards. If the enemy saw us coming, and was fighting back, plan B was for the carrier dive bombers to attack first, and our aerial torpedoes would go in last of all. But when the attack leader fires a single flare to signal that they should execute plan A, many pilots don't see it. When a second flare is fired, pilots who saw the first one think they're going for plan B. In the confusion, the entire fleet attacks at once. We descended. We'd been flying between 3,000 and 3,500 meters since leaving the aircraft carrier until we dispersed, until we had the order to attack. Then we were told, all units attack. So in we went. 7.58 a.m. The sailors at Pearl Harbor are following the usual relaxed Sunday morning routine. It's a beautiful, typical Hawaiian day, sun shining. I had the 8 to 12 watch. And on that watch, you go out and make colors. That means you raise the flag on the fantail or the back portion of the ship. Sweeping in from the north, the torpedo bombers spearhead the Japanese attack. There were no aircraft carriers, but several battleships lined up. I think we attacked the one that was on the outside, two from the front, the West Virginia. As navigator and bombardier, Takeo Shiro is responsible for releasing the torpedo at exactly the right point. Pearl Harbor is quite shallow. It's only around 12 to 13 meters, so it was vital that the torpedoes did not just bury themselves in the harbor mud. And that's why we released at a low altitude. Lieutenant Matsumura was in front of me, and he told me exactly when to drop it, saying, ready, fire. And I pulled it immediately. 
one quick movement. We realized from the wake that it was running beautifully. The attack is underway before the American sailors know what's hit them. In the depths of the USS Arizona, Don Stratton never gets the chance to see his buddy in sickbay. When the explosions begin, he rushes to his duty post. It's the start of a battle that'll see thousands of sailors like him fighting for their lives. the peaceful Hawaiian Sunday morning is shattered by a devastating aerial bombardment. The onslaught catches U.S. servicemen like Mal Middlesworth completely off guard. I heard this horrible explosions. But my God, what are they doing on Sunday? It's obviously a drill, but it looks very realistic. Together with more than 1,000 other sailors on the USS Arizona, Don Stratton is plunged into the fight of his life. I went out on the forecastle and uh, the sailors were pointing and hollering and pointing toward Ford Island and looked over there and there was, we could see the bombs landing and the planes banked and we could see the red sunrise on the planes and we knew right away it was the Japanese. From the deck of the heavy cruiser USS San Francisco, Mal has a grandstand view of the attack. They're coming in to the right of me, so I can see the whole plane. I see it 30 to 40 feet away. One of the planes he's looking at is Takeo Shiro's B-5N Kate torpedo bomber. After firing the torpedo, we passed over the West Virginia's mast, high above their bridge. When I looked, the sailors on the West Virginia below me were running across the deck, trying hard to climb up to the bridge. While some were running, others were also diving in. The sailors and marines on the American battleships quickly overcome their shock. But vital seconds pass before the Americans can muster any sort of meaningful defense. When we seen them bombing the, the Fort Island, we knew something was going on, and uh, we knew the ships were going to get bombed, and we they headed right for my battle station. Don Stratton's job is to feed information to the anti-aircraft gunners on the port side of the USS Arizona. That's up about five ladders to get to their, up there to the sky control platform, they call it. But the other side of Pearl Harbor's main anchorage, Mal Middlesworth is stuck on a ship with no fuel and no ammo. There wasn't anything that I could do to, to respond to the situation. Uh, when you have the watch, a Marine has a 45 caliber pistol. I think the helplessness was one of the major feelings that you had. What can I do? How can I help? How can we get out of this mess? There was nothing we could do at the time. 802. While Mal Middlesworth watches helplessly, Don Stratton manages to bring some fight to the Japanese. It's B-230. We were doing some good, and uh, I think the Japanese were very surprised that we were firing at them that quick. But the odds are stacked against the defenders, and after just a few minutes, they're running out of ammunition. We had 50 rounds of ammunition behind every gun, and we had to break some of the locks to get at the magazines and and get the shells, but uh, we fired all of those and our gunnery officer went down to get some more. In spite of their often heroic efforts, the sailors struggled to cope with the combined aerial assault of low-level torpedo bombers, dive bombers, and high-altitude bombers. We were firing at the high-altitude bombers and the dive bombers that were coming in. We couldn't 
set our fuse for that altitude, all the bursts were very short. They were higher than we could get to them. To provide some record of the attack for the Japanese high command, Shiro's pilot, Lieutenant Matsumura, climbs, then turns, to allow him to take photographs. The shot becomes one of the most famous images of the attack on Pearl Harbor. While the defenders are still reeling from the torpedo strikes, the Japanese unleash their most devastating weapon. Flying in precise formation, 10 high-level bombers target the USS Arizona. The Nakajima Type 97 bombers are equipped with 500 kilo armor-piercing bombs converted from battleship shells. To guarantee hits from high altitude, every plane has to keep tight formation and drop simultaneously. Using a small, white, rectangular flag, the lead bomber signals the formation to release their bombs. From a height of 3,190 meters, the bombs will take 26 seconds to reach the Arizona. 8.10 a.m. Disaster strikes. One bomb hits the deck of the USS Arizona, just to the right of turret number two. It plunges through more than 12 centimeters of armored steel lining the deck to start an incredible explosive chain reaction in the guts of the Leviathan. Four decks down, the bomb sets off a flash in a powder room which ignites two more explosive stores. The superheated gases from the explosion smash into the 33 centimeter armored wall of the front bulkhead and deflect upwards, causing a huge fire burst in front of turret number one. As the erupting gases break through the decks, the remaining ammunition stores ignite. The result is a catastrophic explosion that tears the ship apart. There was a million pounds of ammunition exploded and, uh, and it just raised the ship right up out of the water and it blew to like about 110 foot of the bow of the ship clear off. The blast hits everyone on the ship. Even high up on the mast, Don Stratton is caught by the explosion. The ball of flame went up from the explosion and about five or six hundred feet in the air and it just enveloped us up there. And the captain and the admiral were both killed on deck right below, uh, below me. They were, I think it just incinerated them. From his watch position on the cruiser San Francisco, Mal Middlesworth looks on helplessly as the explosion heaves the 30,500-ton USS Arizona out of the water. It was total devastation. I mean, it was unbelievable, beyond anything I'd ever seen or anybody would ever think about. On board the Arizona, Don Stratton is miraculously still alive, but only just. My face was burnt and I lost part of my ear and my back was burnt, my t-shirt caught on fire and this side is, is pretty well burnt up. And everyone else on the ship is either dead or too badly hurt to help. The fire is raging. The only hope of survival is to get off the ship and get onto the neighboring repair ship USS Vestal. But they're 18 meters above the water, and the sea is aflame with burning oil. We seen a sailor on the vessel, and we got his attention, and he threw us a heaving line. We pulled that across, we tied that onto the Arizona. With burns covering 65% of his body, Don Stratton is in excruciating pain. But there's no one to help. If he wants to live, he has to get himself out of there. His skin is badly burned, and gripping the rope is hard. When we started to cross the line, it just took the 
skin off my arms, it's like a, it would take off a stock. We proceeded to crawl across the line hand over hand to the vessel, which were probably about uh, 70 feet across and about 45 feet in the air. Even while ships are sinking all around them, the soldiers and sailors defending Pearl Harbor fight back with all they've got. 8.30 a.m. As suddenly as it began, the onslaught stops. Once the first attack was finished, you didn't know what to expect. There were rumors that the Japanese were landing on the North Shore. So nobody really knew what was going on. Nobody knew if there was going to be a second or a third attack. But we had that interval to get weapons and ammunition. The US Army has been caught hopelessly off guard. They use the precious minutes to get a few fighters into the air. And the Japanese have not yet finished their assault. 8.50, 20 to 30 minutes after the first wave of bombers hit, another 170 aircraft strike, hammering the targets already hit by the first wave. The other main targets are the airfields, which are subjected to furious strafing and bombing attacks throughout the morning. Because of fears of sabotage, the U.S. Army's planes are gathered together to make them easier to guard. But that also makes them easy targets for the Japanese. Over 180 U.S. aircraft are destroyed, with more damaged. In total, four American battleships are sunk, four damaged, and 13 more major ships destroyed or seriously damaged. In return, the Japanese have lost just 29 planes. For the Japanese air crews, the attack looks like a total triumph. We'd been able to strike a blow at the very start of this war. So as soldiers, it was a matter of great pride. We were very happy. When the Japanese pilots return to their carriers, they receive a hero's welcome. All of the lads in our torpedo bomber squadron from Hiryu managed to return safely. When we got back, sailors on the ship greeted us with cheers of banzai. For Takeo Shiro, relief is the overwhelming emotion. Because we'd managed to achieve a surprise attack, I felt somehow that my life had been saved. With their mission complete, the air crews are allowed a few minutes to take in their accomplishment. The captain had the whole crew assembled and voiced his appreciation, saying, thank you for your hard work. For the Japanese air crews, the attack is a total triumph. Three p.m. As soon as the aircraft are recovered and stowed for transit, the commander of the carrier strike force, Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, orders the withdrawal. The performance of the Imperial Japanese Navy has exceeded all expectations. The attack has sunk more ships and losses have been lower than in even the most optimistic Japanese predictions. But even so, it has in fact totally failed. The Sea of Japan, 6,500 kilometers from Pearl Harbor. Amidst all the joy of a successful attack, all the congratulation, one man is not swept away by the excitement of victory. The mastermind behind the mission, Isoroku Yamamoto, can see what others can't. Far from being a triumph for Japan, the attack is an utter disaster.
Now, 70 years later, we use previously classified military records to rewind events and investigate every aspect of the attack to reveal why and how this painstakingly planned operation went wrong. Japanese intelligence expert Tosh Minohara will uncover a series of miscalculations by the Japanese military that led to disaster on a scale that totally changes the course of the nation's history. January 1941, 11 months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. The operation is conceived as part of a bigger Japanese plan to build a Southeast Asian empire spanning China, the East Indies, and Malaya. The Japanese army's plan in the, in the South was to secure Japanese resources, well, war-making resources. There were a lot of strategic materials down there, uh, rubber being one, tin, uh, and oil, of course, was, were very important. Japan's master strategist, Admiral Yamamoto, knows this plan will bring conflict with the Western powers. And he sees the US fleet at Pearl as the biggest threat to the high command's plans. The American Navy could uh, wreak havoc upon Japan's supply lines. The oceans are of paramount importance. Therefore, controlling the sea lanes means controlling the, uh, the lifeblood of Japan. So Yamamoto plans a sucker punch, a preemptive strike to take the fight out of America and eliminate its capacity to intervene in the Pacific. The Japanese believe that perhaps the attack on Pearl Harbor would be such a devastating blow upon the Americans that the Americans would lose the will to fight. Yamamoto plans the attack on Pearl Harbor to be a crippling blow for the US Navy. But our investigation shows how key errors in the tactical planning and the operational control of the attack turn it from triumph to disaster. Admiral Yamamoto knows that aircraft carriers will play a critical role in the war to come. And the American aircraft carriers based at Pearl Harbor are priority targets in his attack plan. Throughout the build-up to the attack, the Japanese task force receives regular intelligence about the U.S. ships at Pearl. December the 1st, 1941. Six days before the attack, they're still uncertain about the disposition of the American carriers when they receive the coded message, climb Mount Niitaka, ordering them to proceed. Just hours before the attack is due to start, the task force receives a critical update. The Japanese uh, received intelligence more than six hours before the attack that there were no carriers. But they also knew that the Americans were not prepared for this attack. Fortunately for the Americans, the aircraft carriers are not in Pearl Harbor at the time. When the attack hits, the carriers Enterprise and Lexington are at sea, delivering planes for Marine Corps fighter squadrons. And the USS Saratoga is on its way to San Diego for repairs. Commander of the strike force, Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, faces a decision. Take advantage of the element of surprise and attack, knowing that he'll miss some important targets or take a unilateral decision to call off the attack. Yamamoto's preoccupation with eliminating the US Navy's carriers is not shared by Nogumo, who's making the critical decisions in the field. Had Yamamoto given him a choice to uh, choose his fleet commander, it probably, it most likely would not have been Admiral Nagumo. But Yamamoto is unable to choose the best man for the job of leading the task force because his hands are tied by the traditions of the Imperial Japanese Navy. The Japanese Navy functioned like a, a, a bureaucracy. He could not skip over someone of Nagumo's rank for a junior officer. It was that the pecking order was there. 
it was Nagumo. And with Nagumo in charge, there's just one priority for the Japanese attack. The most important Japanese priority during this attack are the battleships. They want to knock out as many ships as possible. Because of Nagumo's preoccupation with the battleships, the attack is launched, even though there's no chance of hitting the US Navy's vital aircraft carriers. It's a critical mistake. But even without hitting the carriers, the attack on Pearl Harbor could still have struck crippling blows on the US Navy, if it had hit the right targets. Because of fundamental flaws in the Japanese Navy's martial mindset, critical facilities like Pearl Harbor's ship repair yards were ignored. Soft targets were considered to be, from a Navy point of view, unfair. They were concerned about this. And as a Navy person, you went after the big ships. And the big threat were the American battleships. The shipyards and so forth would support American war effort, but would not uh, be a direct threat towards Japan. It's the ship, it's the actual hardware which poses the threat. It's a decision that costs the Japanese dearly. Of the 21 ships that are destroyed or damaged in the attack on Pearl Harbor, 18 of those ships are salvaged within a matter of, of, a, of a few months. The Japanese Navy's obsession with hitting the big ships means the attack misses another important target. They didn't destroy the submarine base, and those submarines would go on to carry the war directly to Japanese home waters and the merchant fleet. In the end, it's the submarines operating out of Pearl Harbor that strangle Japan into submission, totally cutting it off from supplies of food and resources. But perhaps the most devastating blow the Japanese could have struck on the day was an attack on the US Pacific Fleet's fuel storage facilities. The Pearl Harbor tank farm contains more than 650 million liters of fuel. Enough to fuel the Pacific fleet for 10 months. Americans simply would not have been able to maintain the Pacific fleet in Pearl Harbor without those fuel tanks. Minohara has discovered that the decision not to target these critical facilities goes right back to the initial planning of the operation. Admiral Yamamoto explicitly said, do not attack the fuel supplies, and at least for the first uh, strike, because uh, there'll be smoke and visibility would be very low. Japanese air power would be neutralized, and therefore, it was ex explicit instructions were sent out, don't create smoke. Good visibility was vital for accurate bombing and visual confirmation of damage. But Admiral Chester Nimitz, who takes over as commander of the Pacific Fleet, admitted that a strike here could have set the American war effort back two years. Important targets like the fuel supplies could still have been hit if Nagumo had stuck to Yamamoto's original attack plan. Initially, the Japanese war plan called for a second strike, that once the planes would come back, they would refuel and then attack again. On the day, many Japanese officers realized that the job they set out to do is only half done. Everybody thought that a second strike was necessary. The person who opposed was Admiral uh, Nagumo. Admiral Nagumo is in overall charge of the task force. And with the US battleships devastated, he believes the attack is a resounding success and doesn't want to jeopardize what has been achieved. The reason why Nagumo is uh, against launching the second strike is because uh, he's afraid of where the American carriers are. He does not know where they are. He's afraid of a counterattack. He also has lost zero ships, and he does not want to lose any ships. He wants to come back uh, as a hero. And he, he believes it's a, a risk that he does not need to take. Nagumo knows damage to Japan's carrier task force could have crippled their war effort just as it was beginning. He feels he has no choice but to withdraw while his force is intact. 
It's a fateful decision, and one that frustrates Yamamoto. Nagumo's decision not to launch the second strike is the final critical mistake in the execution of the attack on Pearl Harbor. America's capacity to fuel and repair its fighting ships is undamaged. And the deadly submarines of the Pacific Fleet are left free to prey on Japanese shipping. The US Navy is down, but far from out. The news of the apparent success of the attack causes widespread jubilation among Japanese naval officers. But straight away, Yamamoto is aware vital targets have been missed. As Yamamoto hears the news, the people all around him were in a very uh, joyous mood. Uh, there was celebration, there was smiling. Yamamoto himself was in a very, very dark state. Unlike his fellow officers, Yamamoto has lived and worked in the USA and understands the fearsome industrial strength of his enemy. He fears his sucker punch will prove not to be the knockout blow he was hoping for. Yamamoto realized that the war had started and this would not be an easy war. And so he could not celebrate. What Yamamoto does not realize is that another critical element of his plan has gone wrong. One that will have dire consequences for Japan. The attack on Pearl Harbor is supposed to cripple the US Navy Pacific Fleet and crush American morale. The United States of America is not demoralized. Just the opposite. The nation is enraged and discovers it has an appetite for war. By sneaking up on the United States and killing over 2,400 Americans and wounding many more, by doing that in the way that they did it, um, that really uh, shook American resolve in a way that nothing else probably could have. But Professor Minohara's research shows the attack was never meant to be a literal surprise. Traditionally, the Navy has been uh, very, very sensitive to maintaining international agreements. And therefore, for them, it was imperative that a declaration of war be made in advance. But to maintain a tactical advantage, the Navy plans for a warning message to be delivered to Washington just before the start of the attack. But the timing is too tight for the diplomats of the Japanese foreign ministry. The Japanese embassy said, 30 minutes is cutting it pretty close. Give us more time. Give us more leadway so that we can warn the Americans that we are putting off negotiations. Uh, the Navy, being very cautious, said, no, let's make it 30 minutes. The Navy says, this, the success of this mission depends on surprise. If we let the Americans know too early, then they'd be prepared and could jeopardize this entire mission and could jeopardize the fate of Japan. This was a one chance operation. Now the investigation reveals how the Japanese Navy's determination to maintain an element of surprise ended up placing the nation of Japan in greater danger than they could ever have imagined. December 6th, 1941. The day before the attack, the Japanese begin transmitting a lengthy message to their ambassador in Washington. It is to be delivered to the American Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, at 1 p.m. Washington time, 30 minutes before the attack begins. Divided into 14 parts, this message is to break off negotiations with the Americans and serve as Japan's declaration of war. The problem was with the last 14th part. And according to the embassy staff, I mean, they have their say, and they said it came very late, that they had waited, it did not arrive, they thought that it'd come in the next morning. The delay is fatal. Before the message can be delivered to the Americans, it must be decoded and transcribed. 
Normally they would have an American staff. She would do the typing and so forth. All American staff were asked to leave the embassy. And so this was done by the Japanese diplomats. And they're not used to typing. They were probably finger typing. And it just took up too much time. But in spite of all the Japanese efforts at secrecy, the Americans are listening in. The Military Signals Interception Project, codenamed MAGIC, is intercepting every message to the Japanese embassy. So they knew pretty much everything that was taking place between Tokyo and Washington. And interestingly enough, they knew before the Japanese ambassador, Nomura himself, knew. The signals intercepts confirm American suspicions that something is going to happen, but they don't give any detail about what's going to happen or where. Without this critical detail, all they can do is issue warnings to military bases across the Pacific. December 7th, 7.48 a.m. As Takeo Shiro's plane approaches Pearl Harbor, the warning still hasn't arrived. And as the first bombs fall, the Japanese ambassador is still waiting for the transcription of his message to be completed. He has to delay his vital meeting with the American Secretary of State, Cordell Hull. And by the time the warning message from Washington makes it to Honolulu, the Arizona is burning. Because the Americans don't get the declaration of war before the bombs start falling, they view Pearl Harbor as an underhanded sneak attack. This was an attack on American soil, and even uh, peaceful Americans were not going to tolerate that. Once attacked, the Americans were going to fight back. To most of the Japanese high command, the late delivery of the message is just a detail and the strength of the American reaction shocks them. They did not realize that this would strengthen the American will to fight, that you would unite a divided America. But to the architect of the plan, who knows America and understands his enemy, it is a critical failure. Admiral Yamamoto was shocked to hear that the declaration of war came late. He felt that this was a, a tremendous blunder, that this would harden American will to fight. We can now reveal the series of critical blunders in the planning and execution of the attack on Pearl Harbor that meant that this overwhelming tactical victory led to the beginning of a disastrous war. Six days from disaster, the Japanese carrier task force is committed to the attack. Six hours from disaster. Intelligence reports reveal the strike force will miss the American aircraft carriers at Pearl Harbor. Eight ten a.m. Japanese bombers totally destroy the USS Arizona with a catastrophic loss of life. The message that Japan is ending negotiations with the U.S arrives only after the deadly blow has been struck. 10.30 a.m. With Pearl Harbor's critical facilities defenseless, the Japanese withdraw, and the home of the U.S. Pacific Fleet lives to fight another day. But according to Minohara, Japan's greatest error is the decision to target Pearl Harbor at all. Prior to the attack, America would not have stood in the way of most of Japan's imperial ambitions. It was quite evident, and uh, documents, diplomatic records show this. The American public did not want war. But Japan misreads America's mood. The empire makes one of its greatest blunders and pays the ultimate price. <laughs> <laughs> 